there are different myths throughout history that people have dealt with, such as the story of Gilgamesh and dealing with the flood. If you've never read Gilgamesh, it'd probably be a good read for you to read, but it's a it's a myth. It's dealing with different gods and goddesses dealing with the flood and how that um they were um angry. By the way, the gods and goddesses were were very emotional um, and had bad days and good days. They were just like any other person, but they had more power and all of those things. And they were always out of control in some way or other, uh, temperamental in every way that you could possibly think of. And that's what the ancients would blame hurricanes on, or they would blame floods on, or they would blame. And if you're not careful, what happens is even the world can make our God look like this. In the first account of reading this, saying, how could, how could a loving God possibly send a flood like this and punish people like this? He must be one of those, like those gods of old, who are just out of control. They're temper, temperamental in every way. And when they're having a bad day, or they don't like us in any particular way, not because of something we've done. It's just that we didn't do it their way. So they, he begins to send a wrath, and he begins to send a flood. Nothing could be further from the when we look at the God of heaven, the true God of heaven, this God, today we're going to see that even in the midst of sin and deep sin, that this earth goes through. And we all have a sense of justice. Even people that don't believe in hell. Isn't it interesting how they have a sense of justice? That sense of justice in a courtroom. When somebody, a child, was brutally raped and murdered and buried alive by a man, which happened. What if there was no sense of justice and he was found not guilty and everybody knew that he was guilty, he was allowed to walk out of that courtroom? How would you feel? How do you think the parents would feel? I do know this. If I was him, like Cain, I would run and hide. Because people's sense of justice saying he must he must die for the crime that he... Even people who don't believe in hell, isn't it interesting how they all of a sudden believe in hell? May his soul rot in hell for all of eternity. Hmm. Coming from the same person who said they didn't believe in that, and that God was all love, and there is no wrath of God. Yet, we're justified when we think of our own wrath. But somehow he's unjust. But when we're angry, somehow it is just. But it's completely unjust when he's angry. And so we see here the anger of God. We also see the very favor and grace of God. That his anger is not, it is that towards sin and to sinner, absolutely. But those, how did they find grace? How did they find salvation? One of the things that happens to saved people genuinely is they become convicted about their own sin. They no longer compare themselves with the person beside them. They no longer set the standard of righteousness and goodness as men treat each other, which by grace there is some of that. But they now begin to compare and say, yes, but who am I in front of a holy God? And how could I stand just and righteous and be saved and have His mercy? How is it possible that I could have this? The more we realize the deeper of our own sin and our own heart and our own corruption, and yes, even at times our own violence, we find grace and we find mercy. So there are two happenings here. It is God's wrath coming against sinful men who are unloving and hateful. But we also find God's favor and grace in the midst of this also. So let's look at chapter 6 this morning. Number 1, we're talking about the faith of Noah. Number 1, the faith of Noah. Number 2, I want to talk about the obedience. Faith always leads to obedience. True faith, that is. It has a way of acting out. There are those who say you can have faith, but it, you, you may not have any outworkings whatsoever. Scripture that is completely antithetical to Scripture. 
It's, 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 um, it's one of those things where you have to understand when Scripture speaks, it says, if there is a genuine faith, then there is a genuine obedience. Not perfect, but nonetheless, a great desire to now obey God who has saved my soul and being driven by the Holy Spirit. And so there is faith, the faith of Noah, the obedience of Noah, but it led to number three, the proclamation of Noah. There are some who say that Noah never preached a day in his life. He just built the ark. And we'll see from Scripture how that is not true and how that could not possibly be true. But in fact, he was a herald. He was a preacher of righteousness. So number one, the faith of Noah. As we start out, when God found favor in Noah, it was not necessarily because Noah was better than everybody else in the world, as we'll see later on. Noah was a sinner like everybody else. But he was a godly man like his relatives before him. Lamech, Enoch, his great-grandfather, Methuselah, his grandfather, all of those, he came from a godly line. And whatever happened to the other children, did they go off into uh, sinfulness like the rest of mankind? Most likely they did. But nonetheless, there was a godly line coming down through here, and there was even a day in which it was as if Noah was the only one in his family on the earth that walked with God, that walked in righteousness, that walked in obedience, that trusted in God. But Noah didn't find favor because he was better than everybody else. Even in Romans 9, it says that God establishes the faith in our own heart that He decided on us in eternity past. Before we could do anything good or evil, He'd already decided upon us. Many Christians don't like that because they want it to be all of our choice, but I want to tell you, it is God's choice on you, not your choice for God. Left to yourself, you would have never chosen Him. And the only reason that you chose God, because He chose you first. And that is the same way it was with Noah. It wasn't that Noah chose God first. It was that God had chosen him. And God was making plans, even in eternity past, on how to rescue this family. And that he found favor in God's eyes. Not based on himself, but what God was going to do in bringing the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord based on God's grace and mercy not Noah's ability to be better than everybody else. But nonetheless, we see because of this that Noah had faith. And it is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is a gift. Faith is a gift that is given by God. But we see the outworkings of faith. So we see, first of all, but before we look at this man and this contrast, because as the darker the world becomes in sin, the godly become more prominent. We show up more and more. This stark difference becomes so much more of a contrast between that which is dark and that which is light. We are watching a world that is going into, as it were, the sinfulness of men as in the days of Noah, as we just read. And so it says in verse Five, the Lord saw. Now here's what he does. He looks into the hearts of men. I cannot peer into your heart and mind. I do not have that ability. I'm not a prophet in that way. I'm certainly not a God in that way. But the Lord sees, and the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every, here he goes, looking deep into the heart, into the mind, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It never took a break. Men were just evil all the time. So it didn't begin just in the outwards with the corrupt and the violence. It began in the heart and that the intention of their heart, every decision that they made, Every affection that they had was only evil all the time. The earth was corrupt, violent. 
This was the outworking of men's sinfulness. What you think is what you become. Is that not true? You think about it long enough. It just comes out of your mouth. If you are jealous of somebody, it eventually comes out. If you hate somebody or disrespect somebody, it has a way of just being pushed out of the heart through the mouth, and there it comes. And you can almost hear yourself saying it, wanting to take back those words. But nonetheless, there it was. And sometimes we do it in coarse jesting. But nonetheless, the truth of what you are thinking and who you are eventually makes its way out. You cannot help it. And so here is what happened with the sinfulness of men. As they were continually in every thought and every intention of the heart was continually evil. What did it come out as? Violence and corrupt, and all the corruption that went along with it. Aren't we dealing with today, and we stand by, and we are watching even in our own elected officials, whom we used to supposedly be able to respect, but utter disrespect for all the corruption that is taking place, but not just the corruption. Now they have no conviction whatsoever, and they display the corruption in open. They are completely open about it. They are completely dismissive of it. They laugh and they jeer, but they are corrupt. We see the violence in the streets that is going on with there is no conviction whatsoever about killing people in the street. Recently, I heard a story as I was doing about how men's hearts are even in today how we are dismissive of sin, how the world is increasingly violent and increasingly corrupt, and increasingly the sexual sins, even in the church, is just risen and risen and risen. But as I was watching a courtroom scene of a bunch of young men that had beaten another young man to death in a back alley, simply because the young man had called out one of the other men on his racial dialogue because he was uh, calling someone some racial names of some kind. Because he called him out on it, he was beaten to death by these young men. What was interesting is one of them acted like Cain and one of them acted like Lamech. The one who acted like Cain, he felt that his punishment was too great. They were going to sentence him to 20 to 30 years. And he had a lawyer, and they took it all the way to this Canadian Supreme Court. And they said it was too harsh of a punishment, even though the young man had kicked this other young man to death. He was even leaning against the wall, taking his foot and kicking and kicking until he broke ribs and even broke the young man's skull. But yet he felt, because he had participated in this murder, but that his punishment was too great. He even took it to the Supreme Court, which basically the Canadian Supreme Court laughed him out of the court and said, You've got to be kidding. He murdered. The other young man, it was a mob that was involved in it, but the, many were sent away. But the most prominent one, the young man that had started it all for the killing of this other young man, he gathered the group together and, and basically did most of the kicking and the punching and, and the beating. So the young man died. The man, young man that was guilty of this fled to Vietnam for two years finally extradited as they found him and sent him back to Canada to stand trial. As he was found guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison, he sat in the guilty box laughing his head off at the victim's family and then making obscene gestures with his middle finger toward the family, the family in whose son was beaten to death by him. He was like Lamech. What do I care about sin? What do I care about violence? Send me to life in prison. I don't care. He had no concern, no cause. No Something had left his very soul. This, he, now can you take that and imagine that this is all over, that kind of attitude is all over the earth. 
But in this case, there's no consequence for your violence. There's no consequence for your corruption. We're seeing that more and more as more and more prisoners are actually being let out of prison so that they can go vote for those who let them out of prison and the corruption that is involved in that. And that people have no problem standing by as someone else is being beaten to death. You've seen the, the videos and people actually laughing as someone's being beaten to death as they're taking phone video. The same kind of corruption that was in heart, the same kind of violence is being spilled out today, but with so little consequence. This is what was happening in the time of Noah. And God looked on it, and he could not stand the violence. The hypocrisy of, of Hollywood that, that comes against violence and guns, and yet they make that's all the movies are about. The very one who is anti-gun and anti-violent is the very one who's throwing their grenades and shooting people up in the movies. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. But yet it's being promoted in video games, and it's being promoted in, in movies, and it's being promoted in books, and it's being promoted on the internet, and it's violence, violence, violence. Why are we surprised then when people take to the streets when they don't get the candidate that they want, or they don't get their way, and they begin to set buildings on fire and people's small businesses that they worked for all of their life, and they begin, and if anybody tries to stop them, they beat them to death. We're seeing it just work its way out, and we're beginning to see a world that is falling into absolute ungodly chaos in every way. How many of you have now gone out because of the violence of, in this world that we're living in, and now you're a registered gun owner? You've gone out, and you've gotten the gun, you've gotten the bullets, and by the way, so have I. And so you, you go out there and you have your right to defend yourself. Absolutely. But the reason it's guns are selling out in the stores and bullets, you can barely find them for your gun, is because of the amount of violence that is in the earth now. It's uncontrollable. It's as if Satan's chain has been loosened more and more. We know how God sees this. So when people talk about how could a loving God send anybody, how could a loving God take justice upon His own holiness and His self, do you not see the sinfulness of men? Is there not something in your mind that says something needs to be judged? There needs to be a justice that needs to happen. This is out of control. And these were the days of Noah. But it was in this that Noah's heart, that Noah was set apart from his generation. It says that Noah was righteous and that Noah was blameless in his generation and that Noah walked with God. You'll see that in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Noah was a blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God, just like his great-grandfather Enoch, when he said that he walked with God and he was not, but Noah walked with God right onto the ark, and it was the rest of the world that was not. So by faith, Noah believed God. Beyond what his physical senses were telling him, God gave a divine warning that was not yet seen, as Hebrews 11, we'll see that in a little bit, when it talks about the faith of Noah, Noah was told to build the ark out in the middle of nowhere, I imagine. And it would have looked unusual. It would have looked ridiculous. But nonetheless, Noah believed God even when he didn't see the waters, even when he didn't see the geysers coming out of the ground, even when everything seemed to go on as normal. Yet, he cut the first tree down. He began to shave the bark right off the tree. He began to make the wood. He began to, I imagine, outline the ground because he was given exactly how long it was to be, how wide it was to be, how tall it was to be, what the door was going to look like. All the measurements are all there and everything is given. And Noah obeyed God, even though he had not yet seen the flood. 
verses 6, 11 through 14 in chapter 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And God says this over and over and over. It was corrupt in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth. And behold, it was corrupt. He says it again. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then it says in verse 14, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says this, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet as yet unseen. By faith, Noah set out to build the ark. Could God have done it any other way? After all, look at the Red Sea. He just divided the water. Could God have just caused Noah to be in his house with his family and the water would have just gone around them? It's absolutely that could have happened. But he's looking to the man Noah and God is sending a, a picture of salvation here, a picture of redemption here, a picture of grace and mercy. And he says, build the ark. It's going to take over a hundred years, but I want you to build the ark. He built it. And everything seemed fine. But Noah was told by God that he would be judging the world with a flood and that Noah should go and build the ark. But the rest of the world, they went on as if nothing was going to happen and that everything was normal. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37 through 39? Listen to what Jesus said. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus Christ in his return. What was it like? For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. Don't you know that in the end times, what will the earth be saying? Peace. Peace. And safety. Do you realize that's what this whole election was about? One word. Safety. Men not realizing you're never really safe. And that, people, and that even politicians will use that word and abuse you through that word saying, we're just here for your safety. And this is all that people want. I want to go on with my life as normal, giving in marriage and being married and going to my job and doing this and doing that. I see no sign, no sign of God's wrath anywhere. All things are as they were thousands of years. Where is God's wrath? When Jesus said it will come like the flood, it will be upon you instantaneously and in a moment. Noah believed God. We take everything that God says by faith, do we not, as believers? Because we don't see the evidence of things yet. That is what Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Ex nihilo, that God would make everything out of nothing, and that he would speak and that it would exist. This is why evolutionists and atheists come hard against the word of God and saying we need empirical evidence, taking things by faith. But as the question that Ken Ham always says and answers in Genesis, which is a great place, great website, if you ever get to visit Noah's Ark out there in the museum, it would be a great place to go. Good vacation. Get a lot of edu biblical education here, but as I always says to an atheist or an evolutionist, were you there? Were you there when the earth was created? How do you, you can't even, you guys can't even make up your own mind. You say there is no God. You say that things just kind of came into existence. But if you go back far enough, you come back to nothing. The earth could not have been created just out of nothing. But eight believers understand this. There is evidence for many different things. But at the end of the day, understand this. 
everything that we believe about creation, everything that we believe about Methuselah and Adam and others living almost a, a thousand years, everything that we believe about Noah and Noah's Ark, what is it by? By faith. We trust in the Word of God. And if the Word of God has spoken to us and said these things, then they are true. And this is what happens. So Noah believed God. Noah, the earth is corrupt and violent. Noah, every intention of the heart and the thought is continuously evil. Noah, I am done with this earth. I am going to wipe man clean and every creeping thing, they, other than the, the things that I save on the boat, everything else will die. Everything, Noah, I'm done. I regret that I made man because they are so wicked. And the earth is filled with wickedness. In fact, the very earth that is filled with the wickedness, I will use the earth to condemn them. I will use the earth to judge them in a great flood. So Noah, prepare for my coming wrath. And Noah believed God. And so, why do we know that he believed God? Because his faith had obedience. Number two, the obedience of Noah. Faith has obedience. Do you understand what I'm saying? Faith has an outworking. You say that you believe God. So do the Satan and so do Satan and his demons. They believe God. They know who Jesus Christ is. They know that he came to earth. They know that he's the Son of God but yet they will still see destruction. But James makes a point in saying, you say that you believe God. What does that look like in your obedience? And so Noah had a godly fear. And so in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, it begins to talk about the godly fear of Noah. We already heard that Noah believed God. God said, I'm going to destroy the earth. God said, I'm going to judge the wickedness of man. And so it says in verse 7 of Hebrews 11, By faith being warned of God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear. In, another version says, in godly fear, he constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Noah feared God enough to believe that God's wrath was coming and to, to by faith, build an ark to save him and his household. The godly fear says this, and I know that there are many that say, we shouldn't talk about God's wrath. Talk about God's grace and his favor. Let's spend all of our time on that, but that is a, a gross imbalance of Scripture. If you walk just through the Old Testament, how many times is God's wrath mentioned? How often do you see God's wrath? It's continuous all through there. There's always a remnant of grace. We understand that. But we understand that God's wrath is continuous and that there should be a godly fear. And that when people lose a godly fear, they no longer see or even fear the wrath of God until it is upon them. But Noah feared God in a right way. He feared God enough to say, I do not want to drown. I do not want to drown in, in the midst of a flood. I believe God when he says he's bringing his wrath. I will construct this ark to the perfection of what he has called for, for me to do because I believe him. So Noah feared God. Psalm 130, 3-4 through four says this, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness. Now, I understand this. Hear the contrast. There is forgiveness with you that you may be forgiven. There is forgiveness with you that you may be forgiven. Because with forgiveness comes the understanding that there is also a guilt. And that those who are not forgiven, those who do not seek the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, those who do not seek the mercy of God, they will suffer the judgment that is to come. Lack of godly fear leads to us doing everything our own way. This disregard for God makes us foolish and does not lead to any kind of spiritual growth whatsoever. Yes, even as believers, there needs to be a godly fear. There needs to be a respect for His holiness. 
After all, even the angels of heaven are in his courtroom. And what do they do? They cover their feet and they cover their eyes because they see the brightness and the awesomeness of his holiness. He is a holy God. But Noah's faith had an actions of obedience. So we see that he had godly fear, and his godly fear led to the actions of obedience. In reverent fear, it says in Hebrews, that he constructed an ark and saving of his household. And so I like what James says when it comes to the outworking of faith. James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith? Well, that's good, but I have works. Have you ever heard that argument before? You, you people just do everything by faith, but we're going to go out and actually do something, and we will be saved by works. But James says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James is not saying that you are saved by works. Obviously not. You cannot earn your way to heaven. You cannot do enough in order to get into heaven. It is always by faith. Ah, but that faith, though, has an outworking. We see that in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. The faith is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can stand before God and boast. For we are his workmanship. Those who have come by faith in Christ, we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ. We were created for good works. Not saved by them, but we were created for good works. And Noah's faith had an outworking of obedience. And Noah's faith had an outworking, and it looked in the form of a boat. God has prepared these kind of works and is just like Noah. He has called us into good works, into godly lives, into living in righteousness, into walking with God, just like it speaks of Noah. We are called in the same way. And get this, these works were prepared in eternity past, before the earth was even created, that we should walk in them as believers. There should be a difference between us and the world. There should be a difference in our conduct, in what we watch, in what we hear, in what we say, in how we live. What about the thoughts and the intentions of my own heart? What is it that I spend my time thinking about? That will come out. Either as ungodliness, or it will come out as godliness. And so Noah's faith produced obedience to God. Does our faith produce an obedience of our love for God in every way? Number three, it also talked about because of his obedience, there was a proclamation. There was the proclamation of Noah. He didn't fall silent in this generation. When God told him to build the boat, he didn't all of a sudden go quiet. There are many out there that are saying that Scripture actually never says that Noah preached. I want to show you some aspects in which, in fact, he did preach. But by the building of the ark, he believed God and he condemned the world. So we understand this. The ark was the outworking of what? Noah's faith? Noah's obedience? and Noah's salvation. The building of the ark was the outworking of Noah's faith, his obedience toward God, and his very salvation that he was building. But the ark was also the sign to the world of what? When he's building the ark, and they're watching him build the ark. I don't know, the, the population could have been hundreds of millions, if not billions, on the earth at the time when you begin to calculate generation after generation after generation. But nonetheless, there are people watching. They're seeing that he's building a boat. Perhaps they're laughing. Perhaps they're scratching their head in, in amazement that this old man is, is building at 600 years old. He's building an ark. But it was a sign to the world, as Scripture points out, 
It was God's condemnation of sin. When you saw the ark, this is God's condemnation of sin. Warning of his wrath to come. So when they see the ark, condemnation of sin. Yes, there was a wrath that is going to come. And it was God's call to repent. Someone said, well, if everyone had repented, there would have been no room on the ark. Listen, if everyone had repented, there was no need for it. Because everybody would have repented. Like in the days of Jonah. God said, I'm bringing my wrath against Nineveh. But as Jonah preached, that reluctant prophet who didn't want to be there in the first place, but yet they all began to repent, and the wrath of God was lifted. It did not come. And it would have been, but God had already predicted it. He already told Noah, like he did Isaiah, listen, you're going to build an ark, you're going to proclaim, you're going to herald, you're going to be the preacher of righteousness, but know this, only you and your family will be saved. No one else on the earth. Did he not say the same thing to Isaiah? Isaiah, you will go to these people and you will preach, but I want you to know something. They will have hard hearts. Having eyes, they will not see. Having ears, they will not hear. But nonetheless, you are to preach, 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 and prophesy of my wrath to come on this nation, regardless if they repent or not. And by the way, they will not repent. Now, preachers are often looking for the success stories of, I preached and thousands came to Christ, and, and we see those windows of grace, and that's wonderful. Absolutely. Nine times out of ten, that's not the way it goes. In fact, there are many missionaries, and I give it to many of the missionaries who are in Japan. They preach, and they preach, and they preach, and you know what? In a whole lifetime of their missions, they may see one, two, between two and five converts after the years and years and years of proclaiming the Word of God. But it doesn't matter. God never called us to preach, many to preach to thousands upon thousands and have thousands in church and to see thousands saved. He called us to be faithful and preach the message of, yes, His wrath to come, but also of His saving grace in the ark. And so the proclamation of Noah, he began to preach and he began to herald this message. We're not allowed to change the message. It's, it's interesting how. Christians want to change the message that God is giving to the world because there is no reverent fear, as we talked about before. This was not Noah. This was not Isaiah. Let us look to the men of God in Scripture and look how they had no fear. The only thing that they had fear of is getting it wrong. They had a reverent fear of God. They did not fear men. I think sometimes we want to change the message because we may appear a little crazy. Do you think that Noah appeared crazy? I mean, he's building a boat on dry land when there is no flood. Do you think that, that his preaching of the wrath to come, that God's wrath is coming, do you think he appeared a little crazy? I'm sure that he did, and I'm sure that if you begin to talk with your relatives and the people, and you are bold in your statements and loving in your statements to call them from the wrath to come, that there is salvation in Christ, you will appear crazy. Because after all, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power. If you sound foolish when you are witnessing. You sound ridiculous when you are witnessing because of men's fallen hearts. Especially when we leave out the wrath of God and we want to lighten it in some way in judgment and we want to lighten it some way but that's not the whole gospel. You have now diluted the gospel because there is no need for grace and mercy. Sometimes we like to change the message out of fear of maybe what would happen to our family. What about our kids? And we begin to think emotionally about the gospel because we know that maybe our kids have rejected the faith. And in order for us to, to sleep at night, one author said, thinking of a softer gospel makes a softer pillow because we want to sleep at night. 
because we don't we don't want to we don't want to imagine that our kids could possibly suffer under the wrath of God just like the rest of society but they've heard the gospel but I remember when they were 5 years old I know they don't remember but I remember and they and they asked Jesus into their heart and, and so I've got to, I know that they're living in the world and they're living in absolute sin and they may even deny Christ and they are walking away from the Lord but I know what they did and we're trying to make a softer gospel for a softer pillow so that we could sleep at night problem is we can't change the message there is a wrath to come as Noah was preaching in his day because Noah declared the righteousness of God. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.5, If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, and he was what? He was the herald of righteousness. You know what herald means? It means, it's a noun masculine, from the word kerux. And it means a preacher. It means a messenger vested with public authority who conveyed the official messages of the kings, magistrates, princes, military commanders, or who gave a public summons or demand and performed various other duties. In the New Testament, God's ambassador, the herald, or proclaimer, or the preacher of the divine word. Here, Peter says, he didn't keep silence. He was proclaiming the very condemnation of God against sin but looking at a boat, the very salvation of God, who would come through Christ. Paul said twice that he was even ordained and appointed as a preacher, whereunto I am ordained a preacher, 1 Timothy 2.7, and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher to, of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Truth. 2 Timothy 1.11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And so it was with Noah. He was appointed. He was appointed to proclaim. Proclaim what? The very wrath of God that was coming against the earth. The very wrath of God that would visit the whole earth. When the wrath of God finally came, God, we'll see next week that God told him to get on the boat. And we'll see even the geysers came up out of the earth. Massive earthquakes were going on. Plates were shifting. Tectonic plates were, were shifting all over the place. And water was filling the earth. And it was coming down from the heavens. But it was coming from the bowels of the earth also. Gushing out. Filling all of the earth. And drowning every single living creature. With only those saved that were on the boat. But Noah warned. And he warned. And he warned, and he warned, and he warned. And still, it was only him and his family that were saved. But in this warning, what do we understand? That Noah was faithful to God and God alone. We also understand that his faith had an outworking, and that he feared God alone and not men. That he knew that the judgment of God was coming. That God was to be obeyed and listened to. And so Noah, out of that obedience, then turned to the rest of the world. I don't know what that looked like, and the Bible doesn't say. But we do know that in conversations, as people are probably running up to him and saying, Why are you building this monstrosity? What are you doing here? This looks ridiculous. And Noah proclaiming, God is going to send judgment on the earth because men's hearts are continually evil. The violence and the corruption on the earth, God will not stand for it anymore. He is bringing His wrath against it. What a time for us to be preachers of righteousness in this day and age. When we see the violence that we are watching before our eyes in every way, when we see sexual sins that are so prominent, you can't even drive down a road without a billboard blasting it in your face. In every way, an oversexed society like ours, in perversion of every kind that you could possibly imagine. And some of us in here probably don't even understand. And even believers who are struggling with pornography because of the easy access, do we not understand? This is the very things we need to be preaching against. It is right for you to say, no, male and female, he created them in the image of God. 
We are not allowed to mess with God's creation in any way, shape, or form. We are the ones who are to be walking with God and living in righteousness in this world and to shine bright as ambassadors. But yes, even as we do that, and even as we have conversations to warn people of the wrath to come, you understand that you could talk to most people and say, look at all that's going on in the, our, our very elections, our very politics, the very running of our country, the very gender confusion, the very sexual idolatry, and every corruption you could possibly imagine, and they would agree with you. Then to tell them, do you not think that God is coming to judge all that? Have you ever thought of this? Why are they getting away with this? It's obvious that they are crooks. It's obvious that they are corrupt. It's obvious that they are taking advantage. And maybe they will this side of heaven, but understand this. There is a, and I always say this in my mind, there is a time that is coming. Everyone will give an answer for all the deeds that they have done. And if they be outside of Christ, which most will be, they will suffer their due to penalty for all of eternity in the judgment of God. But for those, those specifically, and how good of God, that even in eternity past, He would choose some, even from a wicked world, He would choose some for Himself and save them and call them His people and call them His children, His beloved, and that He would even rescue them from a, 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 an evil world like this and bring them back. And this is what we are going to celebrate in communion. It is the very picture of our salvation. It is the very essence of our salvation. Knowing that Jesus Christ was sent to save and that we can be in Him by faith and that we can be saved from the wrath of God. Some may suffer the due penalty of sin even here. We may suffer our own death on our deathbed. We may die in a car accident. But we will never suffer the condemnation of God, ever, for all those that are in Christ Jesus by faith. Just as Noah was saved, so we shall be saved from the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God has already been absorbed by our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was on the cross that He suffered the wrath. He took our sin and placed it upon His shoulders. And the wrath of God came down on my sin and your sin. Our sin has been paid for in full. We are forgiven. And there is therefore now no condemnation to what? To those that are on the ark, as it were. It says to those that are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Have you come to trust and believe in Him? Have you placed your faith in Him? As Noah's righteousness, how did it come? It didn't come by the building of the ark. It didn't come because he walked with God. Noah's righteousness came by faith. Hebrews 11.7 And that you can have a righteousness today that is not your own, but you can be declared righteous by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins forgiven, your mercy, and I promise you this, as Scripture promises, you will never suffer the wrath of God. You will never suffer His condemnation. Come into the covenant of grace. No longer live by the covenant of the law. It cannot save you. The covenant, the law can only condemn you because the law is perfectly righteous and you are definitely not. But by grace, the covenant of grace, the fulfillment of Christ's coming and saving his people. Even as he prayed for them, as we're going through on Wednesday night in John 17, he prayed for his people that they would be saved, and they are, and they will be, even in the time to come. So let me end this way. I do believe, I understand a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a, is a day with the Lord. But the wrath of God is coming soon. How can He restrain so much longer? Do you, never, do you ever ask that question? How is, you are such a patient God that even His patience 
it is running out even as I speak. The time clock, when you hear, and when I'm in a room alone and I hear the ticking of a clock, I think it's that much closer to the day of wrath. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? The preparation is, I have placed my faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. And when he returns, Matthew 24, I shall be gathered to him, and I will be like him, and I will come back to the earth with him, and I will rule and reign on the earth with him. For now, all to That's preparation. Father, again, thank you for this time. We pray, Father, as we see Noah, and we watch his faith. He believed you, even when it wasn't apparent. It seemed that the earth was going on as normal, and that everybody was marrying and giving in marriage, as Jesus said. But then your wrath overwhelmed them in an instant. And all of mankind was wiped out, and even most of the animals, plants, vegetation, all that was saved was on the ark. Because a man of God walked with you. We pray that we could be men and women of God to believe you. And that there would be an outpouring of our faith of obedience. An outpouring of living in righteousness. That we, Father, are your workmanship, created for good works, prepared for us. Very specifically, these instruments of good works prepared for us in eternity past. That we may live upon the earth and that we may be godly even in such dark days like Noah in his time. Even if we were just one church or just one family left, it doesn't matter that we not fear men, but that we fear you in awe and reverence and call you Atakadosh. You are holy. Father, that we would warn others of the wrath to come. Jesus, the whole book of the New Testament, but especially in Revelation, Father, you are warning us like as prophets even today that we are. We have your word. The world has your warning. You even lay it out how it's going to go. But nobody's listening. So, Father, may we be faithful whether people are hearing and whether people see or not, but like Isaiah and Noah and many others, it doesn't matter how many come or do not come. We are just faithful with the message that you have given us. Come to Christ. Come to the safe haven. Come to the one who died. Come to the one who, who paid the penalty of sin for all of those who trust and believe in him. Come to him and be in him, for there you will find safety and rest from a dark and weary Such a great salvation. We thank you that you would even cast your eyes upon any of us, that you would favor any of us in grace and mercy, but yet you have. May our hearts be filled with rejoicing, Father, as we walk out of here, knowing what you have done. But we also, may we continue to pray for the Lord, May we continue to pray that their eyes would be open, that their ears would be in a position to listen, that they may be saved. We pray these things in Jesus' name.